Uh, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this evening's webinar. For those who don't know me, my name is Philip Dogbear. I'm the Sierra's North Seeds Regional Manager down here in the region. Um, so we would normally be finishing up a winter of uh, me physical meetings where we'd uh, shared many a tale and problem and a cup of coffee, but uh, sadly that's not been the case. And even now we haven't been able to have any spring meetings. So here we are once again in a digital format. Um, and hopefully this is an opportunity just to keep in touch with what's happening on the monitor farms and uh, and pending meetings not too far around the corner. So a very warm welcome tonight to, to Richard Payne at Taunton, Ashley Jones down at uh, Smeaton at, in Cornwall, and, and Ben Jeans up at Salisbury. Poor Ben, he's um, he's a sort of had his first year in monitor farmer, but he hasn't really, so it's been a bit of a funny, funny old start, but uh, we'll get going, Ben. Um, before we get going properly, uh, I just need to do a quick housekeeping slide. Uh, for those of you who've been on webinars before, you'll, you'll be familiar with this, but you are all uh, muted, so we can't hear what you say. Um, but uh, you can keep in touch with us, and please do. Uh, on the right-hand side there, you'll see uh, on the right-hand side of my screen, there's a grey bar, and there's a question box there, and if you drop down, you can pop questions into that. Uh, and, we'll be, and then later on, we'll be pleased to have your questions to, to debate um, amongst us. Now we're due to finish about eight o'clock. It might overrun a little bit on past experience, but uh, sort of eight, eight fifteen, we'll, we'll wrap it up. There are um, bases and rose points available to tonight. Now the way to to get those is to pop your details in the chat function box there that I've just talked about. So for bases, you need name, account number, and postcode. And for Neuroso, you need name, member number, date of birth, and postcode. Uh, just to say also, we will be recording this uh, webinar, so if you have to disappear, uh, we'll, you can come back and catch up later. They'll all be posted, it'll be posted on our YouTube channel. And for those of you uh, social media savvy, uh, there, there's Twitter handles there, which will be pleased for you to, to spread your thoughts and messages. Um, as mentioned, we would have normally had a, a, a meeting winter. Well, we have had a meeting winter, but it's all been digital. But as, as ever, we really still would value your feedback. And the survey for this year's Monitor Farm programme uh, is, is there with that link. And I would really, really appreciate it if you'd spend 10 minutes uh, logging on to that and, and giving us your feedback. As I say, whether it's digital and or meetings going forward, I'm sure you've got your thoughts and we'd very much welcome those. And as an incentive, uh, there is the opportunity for some lucky entrant to, to win a hamper. So, um, so that's that. Before we go on, I thought it'd be quite interesting for us just to have a sort of snapshot of, of, of who's listening tonight, um, and also uh, what your what your mood is. So, it's time for fingers on the buzzers, quick fire round. Um, as usual, just quickly click on the screen there on one of those dots to say who you are, and it will give us a favour, as I say, as the mix of audience. Theoretically, there's about 130 odd of you out there uh, who registered. So. Um, we'll get Christian to pull up the, I should say tonight, there are many thanks to Christian and Fiona behind the scenes who are slaving away, making sure everything works technically, which is a great relief to us all. So there we are, we've got um, two thirds of us, nearly two thirds of us uh, uh, sort of practical farming, farm managers, employees and so on, uh, uh, and, the, and the others in the, in the supporting sectors. So the next question uh, which we wanted to put to you, was uh, whether you'd been on a monitor farm meeting previously or whether this new digital format and even tonight is your first experience. So hopefully that's a quite quick yes or, or no question. So uh, I guess Christian should be able to see the lights flickering quite quickly in front of him. And that will show us, yes, we've got a lot of familiar faces by the side of it. So uh, welcome back. Uh, nice to see you all digitally, if not if not in the flesh. And then the next question is just trying to gain the mood of, of what progress people are making in the region. Uh, firstly, on the fertiliser front, um, you know, where are you in terms of getting the first top dressings on on your on your crops? So I guess top dressings with some sulfur and with some manganese as well. Um, so be interested to see how people are faring bearing with that. And if we flick on the answer for that. Yeah, everybody's been quite a lot of people have um got cracking by the look of it and some have even some have even done everything. So that that's really good. 
let's hope the weather obliges now and the crops can uh, make the use of it. So the next question is the same sort of principle on on, um, on, uh, on spring crop drilling for those of you who've got spring crops. So I'm guessing probably the majority had started or done a little bit anyway. Um, and, and I guess if this weather holds, my sort of reading is that people will get on fairly well now, but let's see whether my assumptions are correct or not. No, no, but I'm totally wrong there. So uh, there's um, maybe I've been looking too much east onto the chalks and not enough west onto the heavier ground, but uh, still a fair bit of drilling to be done by the look of it. And then the last question is a sort of um, hopes for 21, what sort of mood you're in uh, for, the, for the harvest ahead, um, given what your state of your crops are, what the markets are doing, uh, how, you're, how you're feeling about the prospects for, for 2021. Or average optimistic and thinking about booking a skiing holiday. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there we are. Well, uh, the the ninety ninety six percent at least average or better. So uh, I would say that's one hundred percent better than the result would have been this time of last year, given the the winter we had. So hope, good prospects for the future. So uh, some reasonable buoyancy. So that's great. What we're going to do now, um, we're going to run through sort of each of our, our volunteer farmers and they're going to give us a quick update. Um, they've been busy snapping away with their phones around the farm to, to give us a sort of bit of insight of what the crops are looking like. And, we, and we're, if we're all happy, we'll run through each monitor farm and then we'll end up with a sort of question and discussion time at the end. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Richard uh, Taunton there. And, and Richard, uh, the floor is yours, as they say. Uh, good, uh, thank you, Philip, and good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, sorry, you could hear me mumbling in the background. I'm looking forward to a skiing holiday, but whether uh, uh, COVID and international travel will allow, we'll see. Um, it's uh, yeah, Christian. Can we just sort of uh, crack on into the slides? Yeah, that, that's Manor Farm for you. I'm not going to run through it all, but um, we're a sort of fairly small farm with one employee. As you can see, we sort of min till and try, we we're sort of going towards the sort of zero till on where we can. Uh, we do own most, we do most of our own operations apart from uh, muck spreading and uh, hedge cutting. And we also have a bit of farm diversification, which I actually seem to spend more of my time on, certainly this time of year, than the actual farming. Uh, next slide, please, Christian. Um, this is what we got lined up for um this coming harvest uh nothing very exciting but we have certainly hopefully with our wheats have gone for uh robust wheats on the disease front they may not be out and out yield uh winners but um if we can get uh clean crops to harvest and we when we don't get a drought we're, we're, we're up there with the best of them so um fingers crossed okay uh next slide please um i'm not going to quite stick to uh philip's agenda so i'm going to i'm going to go to the back and talk about crop prospects and conditions um we we didn't start as early as we normally did probably the third week of september but we sort of cracked on with it and we've got some pretty nice looking crops of wheat going into the uh winter uh top left um apart from my assistant crop walker that is um a field of Graham, uh, which is zero tilled behind uh, peas. Um, that looks quite good, although uh, we have got a bit of septoria now coming into the lower leaves. Uh, the middle photograph is some extase, again, after a, an exceedingly poor field of winter beans, but that did have some uh, human cake on it, and uh, that's really made it uh, motor on. Um, uh, and then the, the um, top left is some second wheat, uh, sorry, top right is some second wheat, uh, which is Skyfall. Okay, next slide, please. Um, as I said to you earlier on, uh, we establish all our crops through either zero till or um, 
uh, min till but for the first time and i think about 25 years we actually got the plow out because we had some wheat uh, going in behind maize which was quite late and then there was a lot of wet weather and this was the only way we were going to get it in and um if you look at that top left photograph it, it, you can see why we don't plow on some of our ground but having said that we put it stays in which absolutely motored it away and it looks a hundred percent um the other two photographs from antidote to the first slide where it would appear that we all had perfect wheat everywhere we've had some drainage issues this year i think after two wet years they've really shown up so uh, the middle photograph there that is just um you know putting on uh, preems where it was too wet and then on the right hand one where we repaired a drain which had been bugging me for a few years and uh I don't know why we found an old clay tile going down across that field which went nowhere so um we've 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 um, cut it into an, a drain my father put in probably about 35 years ago and it's drying out nicely um next photograph please christian yeah all our beans uh, uh winter this year um we still stick with wizard we did try and get some uh links uh no uh, was it links no i think that's a spring bean isn't it um but uh the seed trade really need to get their act together because they seem to sort of hang on until the last minute before making seed available and um actually vespa that was the that was the variety we were going for we couldn't get any so we we, we stepped we, we kept with wizard um that was uh behind the sumo and uh went in quite well quite tacky on top but we got a good take and as you can see from the right hand photograph uh, I I'm, I'm not sure whether that's ascochyta or just frost damage but um uh, there are one or two things happening with it but actually by and large they've done quite well we've just gone over with a, with a graminicide in the last week um just to try and take out a bit of black grass and a bit of brome that we get okay christian next one please um to keep up with fashion uh we have uh for the third year now put some cover crops in uh this is in land which will be spring drilled for peas so this is what i'm waiting to do um we put in a four-way mix uh direct drilled after wheat um you're going to ask me what the varieties are but there's fodder radish um a bit of turnip a bit of uh, forage rape um i think a little bit of facelia um and as you can see it got absolutely huge uh very early on uh the tenant who uh rents a bit of ground off us and has some sheep at the other farm he's turned his sheep out into there and there is now nothing so they've done a really good job um we've just followed up with a bit of roundup where there, there was some annual meadow grass coming in around the edges and that is now ready to drill it is now a bare field okay christian next one please um we soil tested every wheat field this year um we normally do about uh 25 percent every year but what uh comes out of this uh to me is is uh one our p's and k's are pretty much okay having not really put any uh, P and K on for about 30 years, apart from the odd bit of fibrofos, um, which we actually stopped about two years ago. Uh, but what is uh, interesting is um, the organic matter content, which is, you know, just slightly less than ideal, which is worrying because, uh, you know, we haven't ploughed anything. Uh, we do remove straw. But we do chop uh, all oil seed rape, or when we grew it, we did, and beans. And this was behind peas. So I was hoping that the organic matter would be slightly higher. But in this field, um, for um, AHDB, we're doing some triads. And uh, as you can see on the right of the slide, we've got um, various uh, biostimulants and uh feeds if you like which you'll probably uh, all heard about and certainly amino a you'll see in the press at the moment um maxi crop we use um 20 years ago uh it made made crops look lovely but we weren't ensured that we always saw a yield result out of it but uh, we're going to try it again 
the very bottom one, the boost one, I think that is the one that beeswax farming use on in their trials. So, and I think they promised a sort of 10% yield increase. So we'll be very uh, interested to see whether that is the case. Um, okay, next slide, please, Christian. Uh, yeah, a lot of drainage work this year. Um, we ha we've neglected it for a year or two. So we hired a, hired a digger from the local um, Eagle plant, and we've done a lot of, in fact, almost all our ditches, which means that uh, uh, this spring I'll be uh, leveling a lot of spoil and trying to redrill some grass margins. The photograph on the right is interesting because about ooh, two, three or four weeks after we cleaned the ditches, we had a huge rain event. And that is all my neighbor's silt uh, in that ditch. Uh, and where it sort of stopped, I'm standing on a culvert. And that's a good half a mile away from our boundary. It just makes you think, doesn't it? The plow, power harrow, potatoes, that sort of thing, that silt. I mean, a, a certain amount would have come off the banks, I expect, but a lot of that is my neighbor's soil. Uh, next slide, please, Christian. Ah, the bane of my life, um, public access. I don't know what everyone else has had this year, but we've, uh, during lockdown, um, we must have had a, f a thousand percent increase in traffic over the footpaths allied to the very wet weather. Um, but we've had, uh, I can only describe it as devastation over our footpaths. Uh, one thing I have done is engaged with the local community through Facebook, and I've got a lot of support. I would recommend it because the parish council at their cost have made signs for me, asking people to respect the countryside code and to you know try and stick to the footpaths but wh where it should be a meter and a half across that field on the left it's now eight meters wide and i've got another one at ten and a half to eleven meters wide so um it's a problem we're going to have to live with i was listening to a cla webinar only two days ago and i think the only way we're going to improve the situation is to put uh informative and educational signs up not confrontational ones to see whether we can keep people on our side. Okay, Christian, next one, please. Um, other things happening on the farms, diversification, the top left photograph, I mean, you might have seen some of these before, but they were our old, or part of our old cattle yards. And we started about six years ago, um, converting them into industrial units. Um, we've got a sort of gun shop, an illustrator, a gym, um, a man who does swimming pools, an upholsterer, and an engineer. Uh, the, the two other photographs, the bottom one and the right one, is the, the one we finished just before Christmas. He asked us to get a hurry on, and then the poor chap was shut down due to COVID. But um, he, he's looking forward to opening up again uh, on April the 12th, I think. But they've gone really well, and it's been great fun. And I've spent most of my time being the sort of builder's mate going to builder's merchants rather than doing any farming. Next slide, please. Well, this is the fi final slide. We've done quite a lot of tree planting. Um, and uh, the one on the right is obviously just a very nice shot to sort of finish with. Um, Philip did ask me to uh, to just to sort of uh, talk about any key changes. I think... Uh, the, the main one is we're going to try and stay away from oilseed rape, I think, and certainly until we find a better solution of growing it. Um, we're also going to keep away from potatoes as a break crop. Uh, a neighbour used to uh, grow an acreage with us, but we found that up to six or seven years after potatoes, it, it is those fields we always have drainage issues with. And I just don't think it's worth it. So. You know, our, our rotation is going to struggle slightly without those two crops in it. So we will be looking at maybe some herbal lays for one or two years and uh, expand the sheep operation around the farm. I've also thought that we might try a bit of millet in 2022 harvest. We seem to be able to grow it quite easily in uh, game cover. So we'll see whether we can, um, you know, see how the figures stack up on that. Um, Decisions we've made this year, we, we've, we've done virtually no machinery 
uh, investments since 2012 and we've just swapped the tractor and a telehandler and neither of them new but they're new to us we're just going to look slightly wider at grain marketing perhaps um, we have always put 50% of our grain in a, a pool um, but with these robust prices uh, I wonder what the uh, consensus is and whether people will just take spot prices going forward um, and the, finally, we were going to go into a mid-tier scheme this year. I've been so dismayed about uh, DEFRA's or RPA's response. Uh, we had we were granted it halfway through January with, with an acceptance date at the end of February. We put some questions in because they'd left off the entire uh, Capital Works project, and we got our answer on the day that I had to either accept or deny or refuse, should I say. Um, and what it came down to was that um, a new sprayer shed and biofilter overlapped a heifer, which is an archaeological feature, by two metres. So that basically turned the whole thing down. Very depressing, and I've got a, you know, a bill to pay for, for um, an advisor to put that scheme together. So we shall see. Philip, I think that's more than enough from me and uh, I'll hand back to you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, very much. That's, uh, I'm sure a lot of people can feel your pain on that last item you raised there. And um, there's a few questions rolled again, which we'll, we'll save to the end generally, but uh, there is actually, there was one quick fire question, Richard. What, what drill have you got there that you're using? Uh, we use a horse sprinter, four meter horse sprinter, <laughs> but we use uh, Borgholt low disturbance tines on it. Um, which makes it a lot easier to pull and uh, hopefully we um, disturb the surface uh, a lot less. Okay, super job. Well, well, we'll pull back the other questions in a minute, Richard, if we may, but we'll, we'll move on to to Ashley and, and, and like Richard, he'll give a quick sort of review of the farm for those that aren't familiar with it and then and some update pictures from around the, around the boundary. Ashley, over to you. Excellent. Good evening, everybody. Hope you're well and uh, surviving through lockdown three. Uh, it's nice to have the end in sight. Uh, next slide, please, Christian. Uh, yeah, just quickly, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, our farm and uh, what we're up to, we're 190 uh, hectares rented from the uh, Duchy of Cornwall, so we're part of the Duchy estate. Um, we're about 100 hectares of arable on our home farm. Uh, the rest is either woodland or grassland, which um, houses a beef suckler herd and beef finishing, as well as a flock and finishing all lambs to fat. Um, alongside the farm, we're running uh, contracting in agronomy, as well as B&B &B, and as well as the Cornish maize maize, which is ours. Um, it's just dad and I plus seasonal staff on the tourism side and a little bit of extra during harvest. Um, we're slowly moving over to a mint hill strategy. Um, we're currently about 50% plow, 50% mint hill. Um, we're getting there. Uh, we're investing quite a lot of money into our soils at the moment, as well as equipment to hopefully be all over to Mint Hill. But we do have some soils which are sadly always going to have to see a plough. Um, all work is done in-house except baling and muck spreading. Um, those are contracted out mainly because we don't do a huge amount of muck, although the whole farm is covered in uh, sewage sludge each year and probably 30% of the arable acreage is covered in FYM, so we can't really warrant spreaders for that. And baling is more really uh, manpower. We haven't really got enough staff or tractors to be able to do the baling alongside the contracting, which we do in-house. Um, right, next slide, please. Right, so bit of an update of what's happening on the farm. We've got a uh, new Vadastad Tempo precision drill arriving uh, any time now. I think it's uh, arrived at dealer. This drill is uh, will drill anything from a rapeseed right up to a bean seed. Um, and 
because we're doing a lot of precision maize drilling outside of the farm for various people. It's hopefully going to put us into the next step because this drill is going to be capable of doing a section control for seed and fertilizer. Um, and also on the maize maize side of things, it's going to enable us to drill our maize maize and not create the maize maize in the traditional way. Um, because we've invested a lot of money into this Fadastad drill, we've decided that uh, the SF1 green star on the tractor would be letting the drill down slightly. So we've decided to uh, upgrade to SF3, um, which will give us a three centimeter accuracy and will give us um, repeat um, A and B lines throughout the season for up to nine months. Um, we've again this year decided to uh, enter wheat yen and oilseed rape entry. A um, couple of trials we're going to be doing. We're going to try some spring barley variety trials again with limograin and also um, we're going to do some variable rate fungicides and we're also hosting the uh, ADAS fungicide trials again. Uh, moving over a little bit to the crops, oilseed rape and winter barley are very good. There are pictures to come. Very pleased with them. They have now had their P and K variable rate applied as well as their nitrogen and sulfur. Uh, the September drilled wheat is in very good condition. Um, it's not very far forward. Um, we've quite often we'll come out of the winter with a lot of a lot of leafy growth and sort of six inches tall. This year it sat very low down, and I think it's because we've had an awful lot of rain since it was drilled end of September, and we've had our fair share of colder weather down here which we don't normally get. Uh, although the December drilled wheat, the good is good but the poor will be spring barley. It's uh, It came up but it's just rotted. The, the December drilled um, winter wheat has had nearly 600 mil of rain on it since it was drilled. It's just capped off and is in a bit of a sad state. Uh, the picture on the right hand side of the screen, which you can see, is a little gadget, I suppose you could call it. It's, uh, it's from Yara, and this is an end tester, which it basically takes um, 30 photographs of leaves and gives you a result and basically tells you how much nitrogen you should be applying. I went out with this uh, the day before. I applied any nitrogen to winter cereals and oilseed rape. Uh, the end test uh, advised me I should apply 100 kilograms a hectare of actual N. I didn't because I thought that was too much and stuck with the 75 kilograms which I planned to. The winter barley, it recommended I should apply 95 kilograms a hectare, which is what I was planning on anyway. Oil seed rape, it must have malfunctioned or something because it was uh, suggesting I put 200 kilograms a hectare of N on for this next application. I stuck to what I'd uh, originally planned and applied 100 kilograms of N. Um, grass, I didn't do with the N tester, but temporary lays, which we grow for the beef herd, two year lays, that's also has 75 kilograms of N to give it a boot to get it going. And yeah, all P and K is also done on winter cereals. Um, next slide, please, Christian. Excellent. Uh, top left is some California winter barley. This was drilled end of September. This photograph was taken uh, about three weeks ago, I think it was. Um, it's it's gone very leggy. Um, it's late twenties growth stage. It's just gone very leggy at the moment. Um, but we've got a good number of tillers and it, it's looking very healthy. Um, and I think now it's had its NNS, it it's going to start flying. Uh, bottom middle, 
is Ambassador Oilseed Ray. Uh, this is this is really starting to move now. This is yeah, I'm being quite hopeful for it. That is actually going to be my yen entry. And um, just really some ewes and lambs. Uh, we haven't started lambing yet, but I did buy some ewes with lambs at foot about a month ago from market. And uh, yeah, they, they seem to be flying. Um, lamb price, where it is at the moment, has made me sort of think, well, to increase the sheep again. Um, possibly go into market again on Friday to buy some more. I don't know yet. Next slide, please. Okay, so this was taken uh, over the weekend. Uh, the picture on the left is some um, uh, Nickerson's Green Circle two year temporary lay, which we grow in the arable rotation. This has had the uh, 75 kilograms of N applied to it. Um, this was actually uh, broadcasted with. Uh, just a broadcaster on a set of iron bark after we cultivated the ground with our lambkin carat. Um, it had no autumn nitrogen and it's been grazed twice with the farm's flock. Um, it had its MOP and TSP yesterday and I'm sure it's grown from when I went in and did the nitrogen. It seems to have started moving. This Field on the bottom right is the December drilled wheat. Um, this is a crap end. Um, I wish I'd never drilled it or bothered with it. Uh, we had a bit of a uh, bit of an issue with uh, stewardship. It was supposed to be overwintered stubble, which I then decided wasn't our field and wasn't in our agreement, although we've claimed on it before. So we decided, right, OK, we'll crack on and try and grow some wheat. Well, we just as well left the wheat seed in the shed and not bothered. But the good end, I suspect half of what we drilled will be OK. Um, but the rubbish stuff is going to be uh, spring barley because I don't want to look at it until harvest. Uh, next slide, please. Excellent. Yeah, so it's just some more up to date shots. So. Top left is, um, this is LG Mountain Winter Barley, um, receiving its first end, end of last week. Um, p &K is also on, cracking Cornish views. Um, and then, yeah, back on the right here, we're over to the um, to the Ambassador Oilseed Rate, receiving its uh, end here. It's starting to move, it's looking really healthy. Um, I'm more confident about the rape this year than I was last year. And uh, this year we did have a little bit of cabbage stem flea beetle damage and we did actually spray for them. Um, we didn't spray for them last year, but we seem to have come out of the winter with a better crop. Uh, next slide, please. That, that was me, that was my last one. Thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, answering any questions you've got for me later Thanks, on. Actually. Though there were a couple of quick ones which we'll, we'll do while they're here now. Is, uh, have you um, done any T0 sprays yet on the winter barley and have you sprayed for BYDV at all? Uh, right okay so T0 on winter barley it's not quite there yet. Uh, we shall be doing a two spray program probably. I'm going to walk the winter barley beginning of next week and the field, which I said has gone very leggy, it may have a T0 and have a free plan program. But last year we did a two a two spray plan and it worked very well. Um, and BYDV, yes, we did spray the barley and the winter wheat once with a pyrethroid face spray. Um, and yeah, fingers crossed that has done the job. Okay, grand. Thanks, Ashley. We'll come back to the rest uh, later on. Just a reminder to everybody for basis and rose points, uh, put your details in the chat box. If you don't get to do that tonight, uh, ping me an email afterwards, uh, philip.stolber at htb.co.uk and, uh, and that will get uh, the details to me and I'll, and I'll forward them on to, to, to the register. Okay, we'll move on to, to Ben up at Salisbury. As I said, a bit of a strange first year for Ben, but he's um, he's got his feet under the table, so to speak, and got one or two things off the ground. 
So um, Ben, we'll look forward to hearing a bit of an update from you. And probably for some, maybe this is an introduction to you as well. Ben, over to you. Yeah, th thanks for that. Um, yeah, so um, just a, a brief, if you have the next slide, please, Christian. Um, a brief sort of overview of the business, really. Um, uh, we're based, Chalk, Chalkbit Farms, based in, uh, in Broad Chalk in, uh, in South Wiltshire. Um, it's an 830 hectare family owned downland farm uh, with about 530 hectares of arable cropping um, alongside a 180 cow awesome carving Holstein dairy unit uh, on a liquid milk contract with Sainsbury's. Uh, we run a closed herd, um, so we rear all our own replacements. Um, we also run a little sort of sheep enterprise, 350 ewe lambs for, for gimmering, um, really for, for sort of downland to keep the downs tidy and, and um, to sort of help with our higher tier stewardship scheme, uh, which the whole farm is part of. Um, we've also converted some farm buildings over the years into a mix of residential and commercial property nets. Um, we employ three full-time staff, um, three part-time staff alongside my father, Andrew, and myself. Um, most of the arable ground is light, very three chalky loams. Um, we're doing an increasing amount of direct drilling now. Um, about half our arable cropping, uh, we go straight in with our horse sprinter. Um, time drill retrofitted with, with a five-inch Dutch owners, um, like many others have done. Um, I tend to operate a fairly flexible machinery um, replacement policy. Um, we trade as an incorporated partnership, um, and the annual investment allowance doesn't really benefit us, according to my accountant. Um, and we can't really get involved in it. Um, I also think having a really rigid policy can um, can sort of allow you to miss out on opportunities to minimise depreciation um, if we're too set on machine hours or, or age. Um, all machines, in my experience, have different cost curves. Um, we would generally buy our frontline tractor from you and run it for roughly 45,000 hours. Um, again, flexible. Um, secondary machines we'd, we'd buy second hand normally and run them to perhaps seven or 8,000 hours. Um, we have about 3,000 tonnes of ventilated uh, floor grain storage on farm. Um, our winter barley and rape goes at harvest and all our um, cereals are marketed through Salisbury Cereals, which is a local farmer-run um, cooperative. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Um, so, update, um, we've had a busy winter with countrywide stewardship cattle items, um, sort of wildflower meadow creation, fencing off down and reversion, scrub clearance, etc. Um, We've also been doing some dairy investment with the help of the Clutchstone Productivity Small Grant Scheme. Um, I finally caved into our herd manager's request for an automatic footbath and auto safe gate, which should save me a lot of time and stress during the busy carving and serving period, um, as well as general foot health. And this is something that Sainsbury's, our milk buyer, are increasingly hot on. Um, in terms of HDB work, we carried out a lean review back in September, um, which really challenged the way we do certain jobs. Um, we've already implemented a number of changes to routines to make our lives easier and safer. Um, I think the webinar, which we did on Monday, is available online to view. Um, we've also done a, a labour power and machinery review, um, which I think we might analyse in one of our real monitor farm meetings if we ever get a chance. Um, and we took part in the yen grain tissue and soil analysis. Um, this was actually really interesting and perhaps a big take home point for us. Um, on the, on, the, on the grain tissue analysis was um, low Oops, looks like the gremlins have hit Salisbury. We've lost your um, volume, Ben. Yeah, we well, seem to have lost him altogether, don't we? He's, he's chatting away to himself there, and I don't think you can even hear us. I'll ask some questions, because we've got a couple of questions. Um, question for Ashley, the, the, the rape crop that looks so well there, did it have any sludge under it prior to, prior to drilling? No, it didn't. Um, it had sludge and FYM before the spring barley. Um, yeah, we, uh, we we couldn't get, um, of course, we, you can only spread sludge once a year and um, we've relied on contractors for spreading sludge. Um, we didn't want to uh, delay getting drop planted. So no, it was, but it did have a good dose before the spring barley in the spring. And while, while you're talking, actually, um, 
the, also the suggestion that when you're doing your your end tester, had you thought about uh, giving the giving us a tram liner, giving the end tester a, a, its its say on the tram line and letting it do its thing and comparing it with what your your ideas were. I didn't do, but I can do for the next application on wheat or barley or both, whatever. Okay, we'll see. See what. Um, yeah, it might be quite. It might be quite interesting. Although, having said that, I think you'd be a brave man if you let it do its thing on the rate. Yes. Yeah. No, that was too high for my likings. Um, going back to the rate question, it did have thirty kilograms of N in the seed bed, which I'm. Can only assume would equal similar to what your sludge would give you. Yeah, uh, Richard. Uh, hopefully you're uh, lurking in the background there as well. There's a, there's a couple of questions here for you. Um, has your land been in HLS or countryside stewardship in the past, and and were the trees part of the scheme that you showed us there? Um, we were in ELS for ten years. Um, and then when that came to an end, we didn't renew, but we kept the features in, which is basically grass margins, uh, ditch management, and a few uh, tree things. Uh, the trees, yeah, we we've um, we haven't cut cut much down. When we took on this farm in 1985, there was a TPO on most of them, which we did manage to sort of um, alter and uh, massage, I suppose, to our benefit. But um, we've certainly planted more trees than we've taken out. Ben, are you um, hearing us and seeing us there in the background? Yeah, I am. Sorry, not quite sure what happened. Could show you. You were just at the, the pinnacle of the benefit of grain nutrition analysis and what you learned. Uh, out, I, I think. When... Okay, um, I'll start again. Hang on. Um, just get set up. Um, just bear with me. You're right, George. Yeah, I just I don't know what I'm going to. Um, okay, so um, we were. Um, yeah, one of our lean tryouts. Um, sorry. Um, sorry, where did I, where did I get to? Um, you, 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 you talked about lean and, and the labour machine review, and then you were just going on to talk about what you'd learned from the grain nutrition. Uh, yeah, so, so sort of, as I said, um, we had um, we had the tissue analysis done, uh, and um, yeah, the tissue analysis done, and it showed one of the biggest things it showed for us was. Um, relatively low P um, uh, levels in our in our brain tissues, um, and despite having generally high soil indices, um, so we've always chopped straw, and we, we use biosolids um, and lots of dairy farm manure and, and slurry. Um, so it perhaps backs up my concerns over over P lockup on on, our, on on these calcium rich high pH soils, um, and I think it's a good reason for trying out phosphorus liberator this year as one of our used to be monitor farm tryouts. Um, I would probably try that on a half field scale on some of our chalkiest, um, sort of most calcium rich, high pH spring barley ground. Um, we'll then compare um, leaf and grain tissue analysis and also yield using our um, newly enabled class telematics yield mapping facility on our combine. Um, we'll then apply a similar methodology with foliar pea on winter wheat um, as well as foliar sulfur on winter barley. Um, as part of the monitor farm tryouts as well to discuss in the first proper meeting. Um, can we have the next slide, please, Christian? So just a, a very brief cropping update. Um, we've got 174 hectares of winter wheat in the ground, uh, made up of um, group four varieties, Gleam in the left-hand photo and Gravity uh, in the right-hand photo, um, 30 hectares of which is the second wheat. Um, the gleam was drilled in late September. Um, it's, it's on some heavy clay, and we just wanted to get it in before the, the heavy rain was forecast. And actually, even though I had the, the warning from my agronomist um, not to drill early, um, for once I was I was right, and because we would never have got it in in October after the rain we had. Um, it looks fine. I um, mean, a few stuff problems early on. It's a bit forward now. Tiny bit of septorium. It. Um, it'll probably have a fairly robust fungicide program if you did you know. Um, the rest of the wheat was drilled in mid-October, um, and apart from some minor pre-em damage on a couple of headlands, um, which got a bit wet, it looks it looks pretty good, um, and pretty clean in a year where pre-ems seem to work quite well due to moisture. Um, it's all had its first state of liquid end, um, which we're doing three splits, 
followed by a dose of solid at Bagley to minimise um, risk of scorch. Uh, we'll chop and incorporate all the straw uh, for the wheat. Uh, go to the next slide, please, Christian. Um, so spring barley, um, we drilled about a quarter, a quarter of our 150 hectares of Lorit malting barley to date, um, some of which went uh, straight in uh, to the wheat stubbles. Um, well, we'll probably do one part of the Tirana on, on most of the rest of the ground, or the, which is a bit heavier and wetter. Um, and also where we're incorporating about 25 tonnes a hectare of slurry separator solid. Um, whether we sell any straw or just bail it, um, or bail what we need and then chop the rest, uh, will depend on the market at the time and my sort of attitude to risk, um, as well as the weather and my sort of view on on rape establishment at the time and, and what the sort of weather windows we've got. Um, next slide, please. Um, we've got 120 hectares of Ardbark and Campus rape from conventional varieties. Uh, in the ground. This was all drilled in mid-August um, after applying biosolids or FIM ahead of it instead of DAP to help it get away of, um, of any flea beetle damage. Um, they didn't actually turn up really in the end um, for the first time in about three or four years to any significant extent um, and it all looks fine really. Um, to, to reduce initial outlay and risk we didn't um, apply any pre-ems, we, we no longer do. Um, the campus was all home safe seed to lower cost um, we've just applied Corbetto on about 40 hectares um, of the dirtiest ground um, for May weed and cleaver control. Um, it's all had a dose of keys right and, um, and urea, um, and it's just starting to, to really shoot up. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, um, we're growing um, about 33 hectares of craft winter malting barley on a Molson Cools contract. Um, a contract based on the wheat futures price, um, which allows for a reasonably satisfactory gross margin on a crop that, that helps spread out harvest and straw workloads, um, as well as enabling early stubble turnip and also rape entries behind an application of manure or biosolids. Um, this has had its first, or well, this crop has had its first dose of liquid N um, before it will get a um, um, first or two dose of liquid N, sorry, and then it will have a solid flag um, again to minimize scorch. It looks fine, it's, I mean, it's not particularly forward. Um, but um, this photo was taken a week ago um, and it's, it's started moving in the last few days. Um, and yeah, go to the next slide, please. Um, and so for the dairy, we grow about 35 hectares of forage maize. Um, I haven't finalised variety choice for this year, but it will have to be early maturing um, to enable us to get slurry on um, and then a crop of wheat in on, on some heavier ground near the dairy um, without damaging soil structure. Um, Due to the nature, really nature of maize, um, I always like to have a cover crop ahead of it to sort of feed and condition the soil to make the most of any sunlight in the spring. Um, this year, we've gone through a facility of radish and spring barley mix, um, di uh, direct drilled into spring barley stubble um, in sort of mid, I think it was mid late August. Um, the facility hasn't come to a huge amount. The radishes are doing, doing something. Um, we try to target the dirtier fields with maize, um, being late drilling, giving us a an opportunity to get a flush of black grass in the spring um, and we're increasingly use it, using it as a break crop um, sort of across the rest of the farm away from the dairy um, to sort of widen our rotation and reduce the area of break we have to grow in its riskier times um, and, and this seems to be working well. The only problem is we do have some pretty high ground which we tend to avoid putting maize on it's sort of 200 metres above sea level and um, you know, it would be too late to, to harvest or to, to guarantee a um, um, not damaging soil structure, obviously, in late October. Um, that's about it for me. If you have the next, next slide, please. Thank you, Ben. That's great. Um, good, good update. And uh, if you could all come back now, we, we've got a lot of questions here. Uh, I promise you that we probably won't get them all tonight, but you know, those that we don't get to, I'll um, circulate them around afterwards and, and we'll send the document around with all the questions and answers. First question uh, to Richard on this, uh, or two questions really, uh, on the subject of, of cover crops. Uh, one is the sheep have obviously done a good job and maybe it's life without glyphosate because they've grazed it to nothing. Uh, but question is so what's the state of the soil have they done damage to the soil structure in doing that and then the sort of follow-up um, question follow-up question is um can the cover crops sit well with improving soil organic matter as long as it's not all eaten what percentage are you aiming to get to 
Um, two good questions. Um, have the sheep done any damage? Uh, well, not really, but I, I sort of feel that with peas, I can't direct drill. I mean, the top one to two inches is fairly tight, but underneath that is lovely. So I just need to sort of think in my mind whether we're going to be really brave and direct drill or whether with peas, you know, they do need a lovely seed bed and whether we just do a quick scuffle across the top. Um, you know, digging down, you can see all the root structure still there. So hopefully they've done a good job. Um, with regards to organic matter, um, I've heard, I was listening to John Pawsey's podcast on rock and roll farming earlier on today, and he's got up to five and a half percent organic matter, I think. And uh, he feels that anything more than that would be detrimental to establishing crops. So if we're just under three, I'd like to be somewhere around about four, four and a half, I think. Okay, thank you. And um, we'll, we'll keep sort of spinning it around. Actually, a question for you. Although new varieties such as Wolverine and BYDV tolerance are not, with BYDV tolerance are not great agron agronomically with Septoria, do they attract you in terms of not having to apply an autumn herbicide or even just a pre-emergent spray? Absolutely. Um, I nearly grew um, some some Wolverine this year. Um, I didn't feel it being tried and tested enough. I wanted to see some more people in my area grow it and see see how it grows. But definitely, as we were only having a chat today, that um, we do need to be looking at growing BYDV um, tolerant varieties because we have got a very aphidy farm we've got a lot of trees a lot of hills and valleys um so as soon as i've got the confidence behind wolverine and raphael the barley version i would definitely um be giving them a go maybe this autumn we'll stick stick some in we'll see okay thank you um ben uh, keep your ears pegged back there's the micronutrient question now core questions um, do you experience any copper deficiencies on the chalk? And uh, did you see, do, do you have high soil magnesium levels? And if so, why are you applying keyserite? Is there a risk of overdoing the magnesium on calcareous soils? Yeah, the magnesium levels aren't actually, I'll start with the same question. Magnesium levels aren't actually, aren't, aren't too high. We've had, actually had, had soil testing. Um, there are a couple of heavier clay cap fields, which which we do, which do have high levels, um, and we tend to on these fields will um, will grow rape um, sort of further out in the rotation. So rather than one in three, will be more like one in five or six. Um, so it only gets to the right um, a much more yeah a much lower dose sort of per, per year as it were of, of magnesium um, spread out over the rotation. Uh, in terms of copper, um, not we don't have any huge problems. We, we spread a lot of muck. I think that, that that does contain it, and so does um, particularly biosolids. Um, we have had minor issues in the dairy might not be copper um, on, on on a green sand grazing platform that the cows graze, um, and and we we dealt with that with the, the TMR. Um, but again, not not a huge issue for us. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and actually, while we're talking about a uh, question here with the sewage sludge in the farmyard manure you're putting on, do you still feel the need to apply artificial uh, phosphate? Yes, um, we've only been farming the farm here for 15 years. Um, when we took the farm on, the uh, soil indices as well as pH were in a very uh, sorry state. Um, our indices now are sort of averaging around the two mark on phosphate as well as potash. Uh, pHs are starting to come up and our highest are around seven, but our lowest are late fives. Um, we too, well, this is our third year for applying P and K variable rate which um, I think is the next step to uh, easing back on using artificial fertilizers. Um, but for the moment, I still do need to be using both artificial as well as sludge, as well as FYM. 
I guess it's a journey and as you say it'd be interesting once you feel you've got everything leveled up um it's being brave then to to let the soul do its stuff that, that's, I mean, we're we're uh, I think next year I think soil are due to sample our farm again and uh hopefully the the maps are all looking very nice and green and we can um think about not buying so much MOP and TSP and Okay. Well, why are you talking, Ashley? Uh, what soil type can you not min till drill into, and is it one of your long term aims to convert it so if you can? Um, I think you probably could min till it. It is a very heavy, sad, wet, horrible clay. Um, if we didn't have such a high rainfall down here with an average of getting on for 60 inches a year, um, it would be easier. Um, Definitely, the, the clay, real heavy clay, mint tilling it in the spring works an absolute treat for putting in spring barley or beans. But in the autumn, uh, yeah, I'd be a little bit dubious about it. Definitely the stuff we tried to plant in December would never have even come up, let alone um, come up and then rotted if we'd mint tilled it. It was just too wet. Richard, a question for you. Well, all of you might have a view about this, but regenerative farming is uh, uh, the sort of buzzword at the moment. Uh, do, do you feel it, it's, it's something new and a new concept you're really embracing, or do you feel in reality it's, it's reframing a lot of what you've been doing for many years? Um, I don't think it's new at all. I think it's very, very old. I think it's going back, back to practices that are probably grandfathers and great grandfathers used. Certainly I, I have an American neighbor and was, um, you know, five years ago was amazed that we weren't growing cover crops. Um, it's certainly very fashionable. Um, I, I, I'm unconvinced, um, although I'm prepared to be convinced that it works on every single soil type. I mean, we have quite a silty farm, which you know, is beneficial in some ways and, and not in others. And our, our soils can run together. Um, so um, I need to be braver to sort of uh, try it. I, I don't want to have to go out and buy new machinery to do it. Um, you see a lot of people drilling into sort of waist high cover crops. Um, at the moment, our view is that if we can get sheep to graze cover crops off, we've got a free manure crop uh, on there. The old term woolly dung spreader coming to mind. So, um, but um, I feel that RPA, Professor Janet Hughes and the like, uh, really like Regen Ag. And um, I think, um, you know, there's a massive future for it, but whether it suits all soil types, um, I don't know. I, th I think it might, but I, I just don't know. Okay, thank you. While you just a comment, Richard, we've we've got a suggestion of another biostimulant if you've got one to squeeze into your your trial, but uh, we we can pick that up afterwards. Um, yeah. Ben, a volley of a volley of nitrogen questions for you. Um, what nitrogen rates do you plan on this year's crops? And if yen, the same question as before, does yen encourage you to use more nitrogen than you would normally use? Yeah, I mean our, our nitrogen levels were generally a little bit low as well in the grain tissue analysis um, uh, compared to sort of the rest of the, the end entries. Um, I guess that's farming on chalk perhaps. We we use a fairly robust 160 kilograms a hectare on, on spring barley, um, 260 on uh, on winter wheat, um, uh, 200 on falsely break. Um, and I think I think it's 180 or 200 on winter barley. I can't quite remember off the top of my head. Um, so I mean, fairly standard. But um, yeah, it is interesting how how some of our nitrogen levels were low. I wonder the rate was particularly low, and I just wondered if it was something to do with the fact we're using urea, which is something I'm not totally happy with. We got some very good prices this year on urea, so we carried on with it. Um, we're just lucky to, to, have, to have bought it right at the bottom of the market, pretty much, um, pure luck. Um, if you get it right, obviously it's, it's a great, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great product. But I, I feel that um, the last few sort of springs we've had, we've we've put it on, and the weather hasn't, you know, it's, it's stayed dry for longer than we expected, and we possibly haven't 
had as, um, as, as efficient use of it as possible as we could have done. We had some decent rain afterwards. And whether we look at protective urea for the future, um, or just go down the ammonium nitrate route, or, or even liquid. But I do quite like having my eggs in different baskets spread out over the liquid and solid um, camps, um, and it helps with sort of machinery and and, and other infrastructures for saving. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's hopefully that broadly answer your question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And. And would you consider using a nitrogen inhibitor when using liquid nitrogen? Um, yeah, I think with liquid nitrogen, we you sort of you probably lose a lot less because it's you know, it's going into the soil and um, uh, yeah, it's not something I've ever really thought about usually on liquid. Um, you normally see a pretty 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 quick response. I know there's a, there's a urea element to it, I think it's about thirty or forty percent. Um, but we normally see a fairly sort of quick response, so I'm not so sure what, you know, we're losing, you know, it's, it's inefficient from a from a utilisation point of view. Okay, and this sort of related yeah. topic really, but have you considered, sorry, did I come back to you, have you considered using carbon nitrogen balancers to reduce scorch with a liquid fertiliser? Uh, no, uh, I'll look into it, um, sounds like an interesting concept. Sorry, Richard, I butted in. Did you want to? Yeah, that's fine. No, I was trying to do the same to you. I mean, what I, what I forgot to say earlier on is that we are doing some end trials, uh, primarily with LiquiSafe this year. So we're doing some where we will put 100%, it's quite a gamble, put 100% of our N on wheat uh, quite shortly with LiquiSafe, and then we'll do uh, 50 kilos without it, and then the remainder with LiquiSafe on. We did do some Diden trials for Agri a few years ago when we were their monitor farm, and uh, we felt that it sort of ran out a bit at the end. So hence we're going to sort of turn our our approach round to it. So um, yeah, we're interested, interested to see whether some of these inhibitors actually work. Okay, thanks. Uh, just Ben, just coming back to you. Have you grown cover crops on your on your winter crops on wheat on wheat stubbles after wheat stubbles? Um, we have the only one we've done um, is ahead of the maze behind behind spring barley ahead of maize, which I discussed in, um, earlier on. Um, we haven't actually put any on on the rest of the wheat stubbles, partly because we're in this high tier stewardship scheme, which re currently requires us to put in about 100 hectares every winter into winter stubbles, which have to remain until the 14th of February. Um, and also we we run a partial sheet on the farm as well, which um, which benefits from it as well. So um, we don't. I don't get mal on cover crops, but I like them a few. I like to target um, some of the more um, sort of hungrier fields and the ones which I feel need a bit of TLC. Um, the other problem with cover crops is I, I think you don't really get much out of them, generally, certainly from an organic matter point of view, anyway, um, unless we draw them as early as possible um, after combining. And it's such a busy time of year, mid August. Um, and I find every day in August that you delay drilling a cover crop makes a huge difference from it. A biomass point of view, um, and I just unless you've got a really early harvest, and, and, you know, it's not something I want to be committed to doing too much of. But I do think there's a time and a place for cover crops, definitely. Um, and I think as long as you know what you're trying to achieve out of them, um, whether it's sort of you know, or building organic matter or improving the soil substructure, or you know, and, and you need to, need to pick a, a mix accordingly to suit your needs. And you also clearly multi-purpose cover crops with uh, stewardship uh, partridges and, and soil. Uh, Richard, Richard, we had a go, uh, I've lost track of time now with, with COVID, but we, we, we had that, we did a spend a happy day worm counting after uh, cover crops and sheep grazing and not sheep grazing and so on and so forth. But looking at that field now, looking back, are you seeing any differences from where they were or weren't cover crops or where the sheep did graze or didn't graze or is, is it much, much the same? Well, actually, I don't want to talk about that. I want to ask Ben if I can come and try and shoot some of his partridges next season. <laughs> but, uh, um, no, going, but seriously, going, <laughs> get, get, going back to um, that, um, I think we saw better workability, I mean, uh, in, in the following year. But I, I think Ben's right. Um, I saw some data that would suggest that one good coating of farmyard muck is like 40 years of cover crops. So cover crops, you know, is not an instant fix and it's something that's got to build up over time and you've got to do it 
and rotate it. So I'm with Ben in a way. I think they can get in the way, but I thought that for us, where we're doing spring drilling, we can get some free P and K on the field by grazing them off. Um, I can't give you an honest answer about worm counts, but um, you know we're lucky. We, you know, from having not ploughed for 25 years, we do see a healthy population. Although we are probably considered now quite aggressive mintil or mintillers. It doesn't really answer your question, but um, no. we've certainly got enough worms around. Good show. And Richard, you've, you've moved away from rape. Have you experimented with what other, other rotational crops have you experimented with? Uh, not yet. I mean, I, I'm really disappointed about oilseed rape because um, we were sort of always on that sort of, I think twice in recent years, we nudged over the five tonne a hectare. We were normally just under it. Um, one thing I have found that I, I think between that and potatoes is done for a lot of drainage. We're, 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 where we dug around, we're finding lots of rape roots in um, plastic land drains that we put in 30 years ago. And I'm not the only one in this area. Um, but uh, a, a, a happy um, outcome of not growing rape, certainly last year, was we didn't put one slug pellet on the farm. And I wonder if that will continue because that, that's a huge bonus as well. Um, but it is a worry, you know, about finding crops to put in the rotation, especially as we've always grown beans. If we, we've gone back into peas a bit and so everything's bunching up. So I'm going to look at um, some millet, I think, for next harvest because this year is all sorted. Um, uh, and whether it's worth doing one or two year herbal lays, which will do something for soil structure. We might get paid for them out of elms and I can graze them and, and sell the grazing for sheep. So hopefully that's a sort of a win, win, win situation. But that remains to be seen on the elms okay. front, certainly. OK, folks, just while I think of it, just a reminder that if you're looking for bases and rosa points to, to put those in the in the chat box. Uh, time starting to beat us. So just one final question, which which all of you might have a view on, but uh, it's a question about whether you've seen it. I know this year is a better year for for all sea rape generally. I hasten to add. Um, but have, have any of you seen an impact or of reducing uh, cabbage stem numbers with sludge applications beforehand? No, I've, you not, to pick off I've, not, I've not put any sludge or FYM on before I've drilled rape. Um, so I can't, yeah, I can't really comment. Um, I think it's key to uh, get that seed into moisture and uh, get it, get it in and get it well, um, get it going well, um, get some nitrogen in the seed bed and get it growing so that it comes out the ground and motors. Um, I think that's definitely key. Whether applying FYM or sludge, the smell of it would deter the adults. I don't know because I've not tried it. I, I think it's a, diff a difficult year, <laughs> Philip, because our agronomist has said he hasn't got one failed crop of rape this year mm. yet. Richard, sorry, while you're speaking, is there a, was there a particular reason why you decided this year was the year to cut out rape? I mean, sod's law, obviously. Well, I think last, we were forced to cut it out last year because everything we drilled just got you know, gnawed off at the ground. I just think farming's risky enough as it is, and I and I, you know, why why pile more pressure on? I, unless, you, of course, you drill it early enough, put nothing on it, and then you see whether it's going to fail or succeed, and then you can put something else in behind. But it's all front-loaded all seed rape, and um, I, I don't know why I ever grew it. I mean, you know, you can look at my hairstyle; it's probably a result of growing rape. You know, it worries you for the moment it goes in the ground. Um, you know, it's a great entry for wheat and it's good. I think it's good for soil structure, but um, I don't know. I just think it's, it's hard enough a job as it is. But try and look at some other opportunities. Yeah, but Ben, I'll make this the final comment because you, you, you've used a fair amount of sludge on the farm. Do you feel that's had an impact on and, and one of the reasons for your success with rape growing over the years? Or I, I think muck generally helps. Not, I, I don't think I could, I could sort of confidently say that it puts off flea beetle and they don't like the smell I and mean, there is anecdotal evidence for the people that it does. I think really just having having sort of high organic matter, um, decent amount of moisture holding past in your soil, um, 
that extra sort of X factor of muck, really available nitrogen and, and, and phosphate, um, particularly on our chalky, light chalky soils, um, re really helps get it away from the flea beetle. Just, it just it speeds up the, the initial growth phases. Um, I have noticed actually where where we didn't you know, put ni liquid nitrogen on ahead of our rate. Um, when we had farm out manure, we, we put a little bit of liquid on to, to make up the nitrogen levels up to the sort of allowable amount in the autumn. Um, there, there we got really good sort of edges, um, whereas where we had the um, biosolid spread, we didn't top it up with any other, any other nitrogen. And um, I noticed that we've got quite a, some, some quite big field edges where obviously probably a bit of, a bit of bird damage, um, game of damage perhaps. Um, but I think um, it just shows how much that available phosphate on our chalky soils um, really, really helps it get away. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I, so I'm a big fan, um, really big fan of, of any sort of market at a rate. Well, th thank you, Ben, and, and thank you all, because I think we've had a really, uh, really good practical topical and up-to-date appraisal of what's going on in your farms. Um, what we haven't done very much is talk about pound, shillings and pence and talk about marketing actually and maybe there's another whole evening of that but uh, of course as, as many of you would know around each monitor farm there is a farm bench benchmarking group and that really is the key so engine driver of the monitor farm program to, to sort of melt all of all the actions down to, to cost of production to, to compare with each other and contrast and that process is ongoing and myself and David Petz, who many of you would know, uh, 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 here are organising those and pleased to, pleased to see any new entrants into the groups as well. So as I say, time's beating us, so I'll just quickly wrap up with a few, uh, a few quick concluding slides. Just to remind you, if you're not already aware, that we are in the middle of Carbon Awareness Week as well at HTB, so there's webinars throughout this week. Uh, if you don't manage to catch them live, again, they are recorded, so, so you can catch up with them afterwards. And as I said earlier on, fingers crossed and everything, toes crossed and everything else, um, but it's looking hopeful for some the real live meetings in the summer, certainly, and maybe we might get some smaller scale meetings earlier than that, but we have got some provisional dates set up, uh, and and those those are there in front of you and, and will be publicised fairly widely over over the coming months. Just at the beginning of June, there we're delighted to say we've got a, a new strategic farm uh, being launched, which is in the south of England, uh, which will be in Hampshire. Um, and that's for those of you not aware, the strategic farms are sort of middle ground between the monitor farms and the research projects that are happening from Stony and around the rest of the country. And, and we can put sort of research into practice on, on, on field and rotation scale over a longer six year period than, than the monitor farm program. So, so that will be a new project uh, on our relative doorstep uh, with, with that new strategic farm joining existing ones in the East Midlands and Scotland. Just a final reminder, as I say, for the uh, monitor farm survey, please, please um, do uh, take 10 minutes to, to complete that. Uh, and my final slide is to say a thank you to everybody once again for attending, uh, especially to Ben, Ashley, Richard, for your time preparing for tonight and for your openness and candidness tonight, uh, answering the questions very directly uh, and, and, and giving some good answers. I think really appreciated it. Thank you also to, again to uh, Fiona and to Christian behind the scenes. It's all run seamlessly by a little bit of internet uh, up at Salisbury there, but I don't think uh, I don't think we'll hold that against uh, Christian and Fiona. Uh, last throw of the dice uh, virtually for the the winter uh, monitor farm program. We have our final monitor farm Monday webinar on cover crops, intercropping, and, and companion cropping. So please come back and join us on. Monday night uh, at seven o'clock and um, you, you need to register for that if you want the link to listen to that. So a big thank you, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, I hope you all have a, an efficient and, and good spring and as I say, I very much look forward to catching up with you in, in the flesh so to speak uh, later on in the spring and summer. But for now a uh, good night and thank you very much. <laughs>